Kaboom! Good evening. Welcome, everybody. It's six o'clock on Wednesday. It's week 10 in the Big Brother lockdown house. Nobody's escaped yet. Nobody's even been ejected, although it did look for a while as if the uh, British public were going to eject Dominic Cummings. Welcome to this week's episode of Live with Littlewood with me, Mark Littlewood, the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs. Another stunning lineup of guests over the next hour and a half or so to chew over what's going right, what's going wrong, and how the hell we extract ourselves from this God Almighty mess, the economic mess, the civil liberties mess, and the health pandemic, which of course is still ongoing. Uh, over the course of this evening, I will be joined by Kate Andrews, the economics correspondent of The Spectator and formerly at the IA, of course. Adam Barter, the director of Epicenter, uh, the network of free market think tanks across Europe. Former MP Douglas Carswell, former MEP and director of the Academy of Ideas, Claire Fox. Uh, Darren Grimes, the director of the new group Reasoned and also a former employee of mine. Uh, Matt Kilcoyne, deputy director of the Adam Smith Institute. And Karen Sandberg Suval, the chief executive of Timbro, our sister organization over in Sweden. Uh, so she'll be joining us uh, from the last liberal country left on planet Earth. But first up, I am delighted to be joined by the softly spoken, understated, scared to say boo to a goose, legend and broadcaster, Julia Hartley Brewer. Julia, good evening. Good evening to you. Lovely to see you. Lovely Lots of to wine see you to as well. Ready. Yeah, you're, you're on the white wine. Uh, I'm on the beer. Uh, so look, we're, we're, uh, what we try and work through in, the, in, in, in this show is, uh, you know, what's the kind of free market, liberal way of extracting ourselves from this? But we've got to talk a little bit about the Prime Minister's special advisor, because that's been dominating the news. And the IEA tries to lift itself, you know, above the fray of politics and uh, party politics and infighting, that we're not interested in all of that. But I am interested in the kind of questions it raises uh, around the apparent gap between the governed um, and the people who govern us. And you've been pretty critical of Dom Cummings' behaviour, right, Julia? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, actually. I mean, I've got a lot of grief on social media. I've always people say, I'm not listening to your show. I'm, I'm, I'm unfollowing you on social media because I've said I think Dominic Cummings should go. But the reason I think he should go is for the very reason that I am a you know, a Brexiteer and a free marketeer. It's about it's about us all being equal. It's about not having one rule for the elite uh, and one rule for the rest of us plebs. Um, and I, it's so obvious. I mean, no one who's no one who's got half a brain thinks that Dominic Cummings stuck to the lockdown rules. Whatever his motives, whatever his reasons, he didn't stick to the rules. He clearly broke them. Eighty percent of the British public ain't stupid. They think he he broke the rules, and they're cross. I'm one one of those uh, who is also cross. Um, and uh, and. And I'm afraid as much as I admire the guy, I mean, frankly, I'd go down on, you know, and you know, on my on my hands and knees in front of him, you know, to worship We're, him, nothing else. Um this but, is a family but, you know, show, Julia. But it's not that time of show, it's time of show, no. He's for, for delivering Brexit. I, I am eternally grateful to him for delivering Brexit and delivering uh, that uh, December victory for uh, Boris Johnson to make sure that Brexit actually happened. Everything he did on education and when he was working for Michael Gove at the Department for Education, I mean, 100% on board. Everything he wants to do to rip up uh, all the, you know, the establishment of the civil service. Oh, I mean, everything. And, and I know that that puts everything that he wants to do at risk. But I just think there are some things that are more important. There are some principles, some moral principles that matter. Yeah, that. OK, I get that. But uh, I just want to, because I think this is the important part of it. You know, what sort of behaviour can we expect from the yeah. people in power over us? And what penalties should they face if they breach that? I mean, the well, could have just apologised. I wouldn't. Yeah. I could have lived uh, on Saturday. I said I wanted him to apologise. I did Sky News. Right. They were saying, "Should you resign?" I said, "If he just apologises." And then there was the claim, which has now been denied, and we think there isn't evidence for that he travelled a second time. We haven't seen the evidence that he hasn't. He didn't travel a second time. But an apology then would have sufficed. But I'm sorry if you think that you because you, you, one of you is ill and you've got a kid that somehow you're exceptional circumstances. Okay, but let me let me let me try and uh, make the case for the defence and probe into the 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 deep moral conscience of Julia Hartley Brewer how you make these sorts <laughs> of There is one right. really. Um because the the the, the bit that uh, puzzled me, there was only one bit that sort of puzzled me about his story. I, I can't understand the lockdown rules at the margins. They're just incredibly confusing. But if you like, what I found 
pretty compelling about what he said was it seemed to me he acted in a reasonable way. I, I'm not totally sure whether he broke the rules or not, but he, he didn't seem to be endangering other people. I mean, uh, he seemed to be concerned about his family. He remained isolated from other people. I don't think driving a car from London to County Durham, you know, coronavirus doesn't kind of, you know, spread through the windscreen wiper or whatever. So it, yeah. it wasn't. All, and and his motives did seem to be genuine and about the health of his family. He wasn't driving off to see a, a mistress or something like that. Yeah. So I was willing to sort of give him a pass on it. The only bit I couldn't understand was um, him saying, uh, well, I wanted to drive to this castle and back to make sure my eyesight was all right. I mean, I don't know what happens when you go to the optician, Julia, but for me, they, they get me yeah. to look at letters on a wall. Very they different don't, experience. They, and they also the fact that it was his wife's birthday and it was a beauty spot. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the key thing is, look, it's not the same as Professor Neil Ferguson just having his, you know, his married lover over. Um, and again, he wasn't a risk to anyone and she wasn't a risk to anyone because, again, he'd had the virus and we believe you have antibodies. But on the same argument, well, you know, I'm... 99.9% sure that I and my entire family, we've pretty much all got the virus mid-March. Um, we should therefore have been able to mix freely with each other this entire time um, because we knew we weren't, we wouldn't have caused any risk to anybody, but we weren't allowed to by the rules because any of us could drive 260 miles and not be a risk to anyone. But if we all do it, then it doesn't work. Now you can argue the lockdown rules aren't, aren't right. You can argue there should be more exceptions. But when you're the person in charge of, of, of advising the prime minister on those rules, then you have to obey them. That's part of the deal of not living in a monarchy is that you're not above the sodding law. OK, but then uh, I'm going to push you a bit further on this. In, in that case, isn't it up to the Durham constabulary to prosecute him, issue him a fine or whatever? But I mean, they're not okay. prosecuting. They're, they're prosecuting barely anybody. I mean, I was I was in a park in North London yesterday. There's groups of like eight, ten young men sitting around together. Well, they may well live in the same household, but I doubt it. They're not being prosecuted. Most people who break the lockdown are being prosecuted. And many of us will have at some point breached um, a small part of the lockdown with the view that they were making a common sense decision that wasn't putting themselves or anyone else at risk but that's that's the difference because we're not making the rules if the rules are sensible he should have obeyed them if he thinks the rules are stupid he shouldn't have helped make them okay so uh let, let's see how far you go on this suppose in a parallel universe uh let's not argue whether he broke the rules or not let's just he assume did. but let's assume that what he did was in a parallel universe within the rules, yeah. with one exception, that when he was driving on the motorway, he drove at 71 miles an hour, thereby bre breaking the speed <laughs> limit. Is that a resigning offence for no, a public of official? Not. Why? No. why? I, I don't make the speed limit. I'm expected to abide by it. I'd have a speed limit of 80 miles an hour if it was in my gift. These people yeah, design so the speed I. limit. If they break the speed limit, they should resign. Well, as, you, as you know, you don't get prosecuted if you drive one mile per hour over the speed limit. But that, no, the point is, that people people make mistakes and everyone's allowed to make mistakes. We all get parking tickets and people would have. I, I don't trust anyone who says they've never gone above the speed limit. I, I failed one of my driving tests for speeding. <laughs> genuinely, um, I, that, it's, this is a different matter from. It's not expecting perfection uh, from anyone, either an elected or an unelected uh, person involved in government. It's about expecting people to obey the spirit of the law, to to be seen to be attempting to act within the law and when you have a pandemic when you have a lockdown now you can say we shouldn't have had a lockdown that's a perfectly valid scientifically based argument you could say we should have had a stricter lockdown but the point is if you have been a, a, a you know your advisor to the government to the prime minister and you sat in on those sage meetings you know all the reasons why those laws have come in you've been a party to it you've been uh, you know backing it up you can't then say that rule should exist for 66 million people but not for me you, that's just not tenable. Um, and so you think he should get a fine as well as some sort, as well as losing his job, yeah? I mean, he's, if he has broken the rules. Um, I, I think there is an argument that he, the law should be seen to be enforced. I, I Not in a punitive way, but just, you know, he can afford the fine. The point is that 
all the millions of people who didn't break the law because they thought that it was the right thing to do. They, the argument that he put his family first, well, millions of people had to obey the law and not put their families first. They, they didn't. We've heard all these stories. People didn't get to say goodbye to a dying grandparent, uh, people who've not got to meet their grandchildren. Are we seriously saying all of those people would have been at risk or put the country at risk of uh, spreading the pandemic if they'd seen their loved ones? No, probably not. But they haven't done it because they believe in the message we've been told, save the NHS. Now, you can call them fools if you want. I don't. I call them good citizens. But but the point is, when Dominic Cummings is able to say, I'm just going to make rules for myself and okay. use my own common sense, you are saying, effectively, everyone else is an idiot. Okay, but with the uh, exception of the uh, highly principled example of your good self <laughs> and, uh, and possibly uh, Steve Baker MP, it seems to me, and what's really worried me about this, is the trial by media seems to have basically split on partisan lines, right? So it hasn't so much been a forensic investigation about whether this man did right or wrong, yeah. or whether he was actually sort of within the spirit of the rules, or whether he's told the whole truth. It's a po political opponents yes. of Dominic Cummings gunning for him, oh, yes. and political supporters of Dominic Cummings justifying his actions. Oh, I mean, that's a disastrous way of deciding guilt and innocence, right? Yes, and well, but there are two arguments in that. One is that I'm, I'm someone who is massively on Dominic Cummings' side on everything else other than this breach of the, of the rules. Um, and there are plenty of other people like me, like Ian Dale, like Mark Wallace and others who who, who very much believe in, in what his, his his mission is in politics, uh, but still think there is, a, there is a more sort of profound principle at stake yeah it's definitely spit on party lines but I, I tweeted the other day you know, it is possible that two things can be true at the same time that that this is a massive witch hunt against a man that the whole Ramona media and political establishment absolutely hellos and despise and want to depose or depose and that he broke the rules and should resign those two things can both be true at the same time and i would argue given that he is a hate figure even for many on his own side i mean even there, there are plenty of tory leavers who loathe dominic cummings he seems to have an ability to make enemies wherever he goes what given that he knows that is there not more reason for him to make sure that he doesn't put a foot wrong Okay. If he's uh, a genius, he should know that, shouldn't he? Yeah. If he's well, so I mean, bloody clever, wouldn't he know if I do something stupid like blatantly break the lockdown rules, someone might notice and care about it? Yeah, that, that's interesting because obviously he's made his career on understanding public opinion, basically, oh. right? I mean, that's what he brings to the table with uh, an, a, a flair and uh, insight that yeah. uh, you know few others of his generation have displayed. But the, the other thing I wanted to um, pick your brains about, though, is is the the media pack. So, as I say, you're you're actually a, a shining example because I bet most people would have assumed Julia will find a reason to be pro Cummings, right? And yes. and so, you know, credit to you, to you. You know, even if I disagree with you on some of that, I know uh, for sure that you're making a sincere um, uh, decision. But I, I I thought that the sort of media pack outside of his house and everything, and I, obviously I believe in a um, free press and all that was was pretty ridiculous i mean they were sort of complaining he'd broken the lockdown rules and was he social distancing <laughs> while the paparazzi are all piling on top of each other no way were those people two meters oh, apart now, absolutely now they don't they don't make the rules i get that they're, they're journalists so they haven't they're not the law makers but i mean there was no effort at all to observe social distance. No, and also continuing to crowd outside his home, and particularly after he'd done that statement on Bank Holiday Monday, um, he, you know, he's made his statement. He, you know, he had the he, you know, he answered the questions. He didn't avoid any questions. You can you can believe or not believe his answers, but that's the, that's the end of the, that side of things. I don't think there's any any justification to have people outside, certainly not the people shouting abuse, the neighbours in the street. Um, I mean, and, and, and you know, the likes of Emily Thornbury, uh, you know, joining in, uh, tweeting, basic, to all intents and purposes, condoning someone, uh, people abusing and shouting someone in their own street. It must be horrific. Um, no, he's got a four-year-old, he's got a wife. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I think he should be left alone on that front. I think this is a matter for the Prime Minister now. We've heard the story. Um, I was tweeting out again at the weekend. Look, you know, let, let's hear him in his own words, do a press conference, answer the questions and we'll decide. Well, he did it. Um, and 80 percent of the population have decided they don't agree that he did something um, completely innocent. Um, so but when did it's, this... it's a matter for the prime minister. They should be they should be bothering the prime minister about it, not him. So so when did uh, 
as I say, you know, the the IEA supports, you know, the fundamental institutions of a free society. That's what's written in our mission. That clearly involves a free press. But when did this doorstepping stuff not just begin to happen? But I mean, it it now seems perennial, right? Oh, it's always happened. I mean, I was a door. I was a news reporter on the Evening Standard and the Guardian. Go back in the. God, I'm showing my age now. Late nineties. I'm great at a doorstep. You you want to get inside the door of somebody? I'm 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 your girl. it's been happening forever. The point is, we what we didn't have until a few years ago was was lots of other people with their with their phones on showing us the doorstep. The doorsteps have happened outside anyone who's in the news, often outside the, the you know the homes of very innocent people who just simply happen to be the relatives of someone who's done something, whether good or bad. Um, it happens all the time. Now there are rules that, that you can actually you know if you if you put in a you know you know to put in a call to the right people, and then the press will be told basically. This person doesn't want to speak. Stand by, you know, stand down, and you're not allowed to then go and harass them. I think, I think we are in harassment territory in terms of Dominic Cummings now. Um, yeah, no, that, I, I, but it just it seems to me, although I want our politicians held to account, cross-examined yeah. properly, that it does now seem in, almost impossible uh, for a politician, or in the case of Dominic Cummings, a political advisor, to make the journey from his front door to his waiting car without being harassed and harangued. And, you know, in a general election campaign, this will happen to sort of every party leader every morning. Um, And that, to my mind, seems to be more about generating uh, TV footage, hoping that they, you know, swear or swing a punch or spin at somebody or, you know rather than it's proper investigative journalism. Right? Yeah, it is. I mean, it is. We saw that, didn't we? we let's go back to the days of Diana. I mean, that's exactly what they did. They used to they used to bait her to get her to react, and then she'd cry, and then they'd have photographs of her crying. Look, yeah, it, it's, it, I don't think it serves any purpose. The same as uh, uh, BBC and Sky Journal is shouting at uh, ministers as they go into number 10. It's all a bit of fun, but I don't think it serves any purpose. I'm not sure it... Uh, I'm, I'm not sure it puts us in the best light. The trouble is, again, it's 24/7 news. We've got to fill it. You know, I'm, you know, I'm still a member of, a, you know, I'm a journalist. I'm, a, I'm a still a member of the lobby, in fact, um, and I've done my share of the, the press facts. Um, I think it's gone a little bit out of control. But I think the key thing to look at, as someone who is sort of on both fences here, so someone who thinks that Dominic Cummings did do something wrong and should go, but someone who's who's a staunch lever and uh, and supportive of what this government is doing in lots of ways. Um, I, I can see both sides of this, and I do think that the media has lost its minds over this, as it did, you know, way back in 2016 over Brexit generally. And because they, they there is a press pack that kind of thinks uh, all of them, you know, in the same way. And I know people talk about, oh, we got the Telegraph and the Mail and their and their Brexit support and, and the sound breaks is sporting papers but you know the the huge 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 sway of channel four and the bbc and sky news and all the different national radio stations under the bbc they are all completely starved from top to bottom with staunch ramonas they hate dominic cummings they they think he's the devil incarnate sure. and they will do anything to get rid of him well well let's uh julia stay with us but uh let's be joined now by somebody who doesn't think that uh uh, Dominic Cummings is the devil incarnate, and I, I know you don't either, but um, uh, uh, takes, uh, I think, a more sympathetic view of his actions. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Douglas Carswell uh, joining us, uh, the former UKIP MP and Conservative MP, uh, author of many books, classical liberal, and he's now recently set up the uh, Good Governance Project and you know, heck, we certainly need some of that pretty, pretty goddamn fast. But I'm going to, Douglas, uh, welcome, welcome. Thank you very much for, for joining us. I was trying to get, uh, in, in talking to Julia, and I'd welcome y- your view on this, not not so much the ins and outs of who drove where when, but what are the standards that we should be holding these sort of people to? Um, and in Dominic Cummings' case, it's an oddity, right, because he's an appointment, he's, he's not an elected politician, um, uh, uh, what's your take of how this has uh, panned out? Not just in terms of, you know, when did he drive where, who did he sign it off with, and the forensics of it, but what we as the public should expect of Dominic Cummings' behaviour. Well, obviously, I'm not here to discuss uh, Dominic's childcare arrangements. Um, I, I very much hope that those who say he broke the rules are, are willing to point out actually which part of Section 6 of the Act he, he breached. Um, 
I think quite clearly, if you're in government, you, you have to abide by, by the rules. But having looked at Section 6 in quite a lot of detail, actually, as someone who's deeply sceptical about the lockdown, as, as someone who, who finds many things within Section 6 rather objectionable, I, I, I'm not certain uh, that, that uh, Dominic did breach any of, of, of the rules as stipulated in Section 6. But I, I think this is a, a subject for another day. I mean, I think the fundamental problem is that if you have a lockdown that moves from being advisory, what you might call the Swedish model, to being compulsory, you're inevitably going to end up in this situation of trying to prescribe all sorts of activity. You end up in this ridiculous situation we have today where your mother can't come into your house but your cleaner can. No one's actually said what happens if you appoint your mother to be your cleaner. Presumably that's allowed. But you end up with these ridiculous rules. What we need is a proper classical liberal approach to the lockdown. We should tell people what the risks are, encourage them to do the right thing, but fundamentally recognize that every one of them has a life to live of their own and we're not here to micromanage people. People left school a long time ago, in the case of our kids, all too long ago. But people left school, we're not here to schoolmaster them. Ministers aren't here to tell them how to live their lives. People should be left to manage risk for themselves. That's really interesting. So, And uh, I wanted to get onto this, that the that the approach to lockdown should have been kind of principles driven, you think. Uh, I mean, there, there's two questions, aren't there? One is, is it compulsory or advisory? And then the other, is it sort of driven by principles or is it, you know, uh, driven by exact measurements like two metres and where you can you can meet people in a park? But, you know, is this a park or is uh, I mean, the, you know, we're now going to be able to re reopen car showrooms. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't I don't know whether the IEA can park a, you know, my car outside with a for sale sign on it. And that makes us a car showroom. The more you get the very prescriptive, precise rules. Actually, the more you get these oddities, isn't that right? Uh, absolutely. Not just oddities, actual sort of absurdities. And I think it's it's the absurdities of the lockdown that have undermined the lockdown. It's nothing to do with what a special advisor might or might not have done. Take, for example, the, the rule that was introduced basically forbidding people from sunbathing. Outdoor activity in the sun, sitting in a park, minding your own business was absolutely verboten. But while the state was busy telling us not to sunbathe, they forgot about taking care of the care homes, which is where 40% of all deaths of this disease have now taken place. So it's not just that it's annoying and ridiculous, it's actually positively harmful if the state tries to be so prescriptive, because it means it's focused on doing things it shouldn't be worried about. We should be left to make these judgments about whether we go shopping or not. The state should have done the things that the state ought to have been able to do, such as making sure that the NHS didn't spread the disease the way, unfortunately, it appears to have spread. Julia, let me bring you in. We were talking about, you know, whether the rules are right or wrong. You were saying sort of neither here nor there. If somebody breaks the rules that they've designed, they should be in trouble. But what would your actual approach to the lockdown be? I mean, do you think that the we're so, are we now in a position where the government should issue general advice, admit that it's a bit of a grey area, and if somebody says, "Well, I need to know exactly whether I can meet my aunt Mary, but I can't meet my uncle Tom," they say, "Well, we can't advise you exactly on that. You know, here's a bit of guidance. Decide, uh, you know, decide how you interpret it. It should be like eat your fruit and veg, but I mean, we don't tell you exactly how many carrots to eat every day, right? Yeah, it's not. It doesn't just mean baked beans. Um, do you know, I've I've changed my view quite a lot on this. Um, unlike pretty much everyone on social media, I I am not an epidemiologist or a statistician. I'm I'm not an expert in this field, and so I I was very much the view I would be guided guided by not only the likes of Chris Whitty and Sir Patrick Balance, but also by the huge number of experts that I speak to on my talk radio breakfast show every morning. Um, you know, World Health Organization, every, you know, from you know, every single point of view we've had. And the more I've looked at the statistics around the world of what everyone's done, um, what's happened in Southeast Asia, South Korea, um, in, um, uh, and what's happened in Sweden, the more I've come to the view that actually a country like the UK, we would have been able to actually manage a, a voluntary lockdown uh, like Sweden. Um, I do think the, what, again, it ties actually interestingly into Brexit is the history of our country is very different from the history of many of the, the nations on the European continent, which did go with this very sort of almost sort of, you know, police state, you know, France, my, my, my father is and his partner are in France for the whole of the lockdown there. And, and they, you know, having to produce a piece of paper before you can leave the house. In Spain, children banned from leaving the house for six weeks. And we didn't have it's anything well like that here. Yeah, and I do, I do wonder actually if we could have done what what Sweden's done. And people always point to these figures for oh, it's there is their 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 deaths are much higher than say the neighbouring countries. But but they they but given they haven't had a formal lockdown, the people who sh who needed to be safe 
have been safe, those uh, who have uh, needed to shield the, the, the poorly, the, the vulnerable, the elderly. Um, there's, I'm increasingly of the view now that we could have done this with most people still out and about, people like me able to work from home, working from home, um, but keeping the schools going as much as possible, uh, at least you know, classes going in every other week, if you had to halve the number of kids, certainly keeping as many people at work as possible, um, and, and not this massive, massive impact on our liberty. Um, and I think, again, maybe that just comes down to the government not trusting the people. And we know governments don't trust the people, don't we? Yeah, well, that, uh, D- Douglas, would, would that have been your view from the outset? Because um, the, I mean, the, the argument at the outset, which I had some sympathy for, it's not the position I would have started from, was the sort of protect the NHS. The problem is, if kind of all of us get sick on the very same Tuesday, then the hospitals and the ventilators and the IC unit, units will be overwhelmed. So, if we, even if the number of people who are going to get ill is fixed, it would be extremely useful to manage that over a period of time rather than it to all happen. Uh, in the middle of next week. But as my colleague at the IEA, Chris Snowden, tweeted out the other day, week 10, is the NHS safe yet? Um, and uh, I mean, we, we haven't come close to capacity, have we? we? We were told that we had to have a lockdown for initially for three weeks in order to make sure that there was time to create that capacity within the healthcare system. Clearly, we've got the capacity. Mercifully, all those ventilators in the Nightingale hospitals were never actually used. But we still got the lockdown. It, it seems as if yet again we see a, a policy launched by public officials seeking a, a post facto justification. The initial reason for the lockdown was to create the capacity in the, in the NHS. But I, I, I think it's deeply alarming because I, 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 I think we're in danger now of creating something far more devastating than this virus, and that is a 20, 30 percent fall in GDP. Now, to someone like me who's in the middle of their career, that's not quite so catastrophic. But to a lot of people in their 20s, for whom the risks of this disease are almost negligible, I, I, I think it's absolutely extraordinarily catastrophic. It, it interrupts their career at the very moment when it should be taking off. And it's by no means certain that many of these jobs are going to come back. Yeah. We are in this extraordinary world where the furlough has deferred a lot of the pain. That pain is going to come. And a lot of it is so unnecessary. We could have lifted the lockdown a month ago, and I think we would be no worse off from an epidemiological point of view. We would be considerably better off in terms of social welfare, our children's education, and the economy. And Douglas, I I wanted to ask you, and then I'll come back to all of these experts that have been on Julia's show, because it's been a long-running theme in recent politics uh, uh, during the Brexit referendum and beyond about the experts and people who uh, tend to cast a note of scepticism are if sometimes I think wrongly accused of uh, being in favour of ignorance. I mean, I'm in favour of expertise, but I wish sometimes, Douglas, that these people knew the limits of their own forecasting ability. So I'm not an epidemiologist, but neither do I necessarily consider somebody who is a trained epidemiologist to be able to perfectly predict the exact numbers of deaths in Britain if we do X or Y. So how do you think we tackle this sort of expertise Thing. I mean, I'm a classical liberal and therefore sceptical about uh, uh, people forecasting the future as central planners. But uh, to what extent should we listen to these people? Or to what extent uh, is this a bit like Brexit all over again? Every project fear forecast has turned out to be catastrophically wrong. There are two problems. Within the narrow field of epidemiology, there's a problem because a lot of the models that epidemiologists create to study the spread of diseases presume to have a number of variables. And as Hayek would have pointed out, you simply can't assemble in one place enough information. We now know that, for example, vitamin D and and, and temperature and and a a whole range of variables influence the spread of this disease, things that we're still learning about and will probably be learning about in, in months, if not years to come. So even in a narrow epidemiological point of view, you cannot build a model that can predict the future. But I think the really big mistake in public policy terms is to leave it to someone who has an interest in the spread of a virus to prescribe what should be done for the whole of society. Of course, if 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 you're a hammer, you tend to see the world in terms of nails to hit. If you're a virologist, you tend to see the world as revolving around the spread of deadly viruses. 
there are other things to consider in this, yeah. particularly if you're a 20 year old who's who's very unlikely to ever be significantly impacted personally by this disease. And we saw a similar thing a decade ago with the banks when central bankers were put in charge of monetary policy to save the banks. Yes, they saved the banks, but at enormous cost to people who were frankly blameless. You would never put bakers in charge of flour distribution policy. If you did, they would end up giving themselves subsidies and creating artificially inflated bread prices. So why do we assume that we should put experts in charge of their field? Government is about taking a more balanced view about the interests of the whole of society. And I think if you're going to do that, you need to be very, very sceptical about someone coming along with a spreadsheet claiming yeah. to have some very wisdom. Yeah. So, so Julia, let let Douglas and myself give your profession a damn good kicking here, because isn't there a isn't there a danger that you'll? Uh, I'm not saying you particularly on your show necessarily. Your your show will be of a high, uh, far higher standard than most of the Absolutely. useless uh, media that we that we have in the world. But isn't there a danger that the media crave somebody appearing on their show who's able to say, "I am an epidemiologist," um, and has some report out that says. And if we don't do X, half a million people will die. I mean, this yeah. is just great radio, right? Let's put yeah. this person on half a million, really, that high. I mean, it's just... It's, and but it's also, not yes, very we don't, helpful. We don't trust politicians, so we trust the science. I mean, it's the science. And we've had this, haven't we, over climate change. And that's, that's the, this is when the science, the whole point of science is it's not the science. It's the whole... The whole bleeding definition of science is that it's not one thing the whole point of science is getting it wrong learning more the whole process is being able to prove that something was wrong that's that's kind of the, the entire methodology um yeah of course journalists love that and this idea that there are these people who are the soothsayers the people who will just pronounce from on high with, and produce these tablets which we can come down to the mountain and go see you politicians are wrong and that's partly because politicians have got a bad name but politics is a bad name so one of the criticisms of Boris Johnson and the cabinet generally has been you've been making political decisions during this pandemic well, well duh yeah, yeah. I mean, because making decisions about what to do you know whether you do what Trump does or what Macron does or, or or Merkel or you know Sweden does of course those are political decisions and of course your your general view about what motivates people in society what what is what is a, a good in society or not will actually uh, have an effect on that and of course politics is going to have a massive impact also on, on how people get out of this lockdown and it's absolutely fascinating every single day to see pretty much the entire liberal level Left, basically saying we'd like to stay in our homes for the next 10 years please because we're terrified and scared oh by the way we've still got jobs we've either been furloughed or we're still on full pay because we work in the public sector or you yeah. know we've got laptops we're fine we're working from home sod the working class who bizarrely don't have jobs they can do from home because you can't be a taxi driver or a waitress or work in a shop if you were if 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 you know if you've got those sort of work zoom isn't zoom, zoom isn't very useful to a waitress or a cab driver no. right and, and this is and this is the thing and there, there seems to be two very big different schools of, of opinion and schools being another factor the entire public sector seem to be saying we're just fine we're waiting till zero risk I mean, I mean, you've got more. My child would be back at school two bloody months ago if it was up to me. She's got more chance of getting run over on the road to school than she has of 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 getting ill in any serious fashion, let alone dying of COVID nineteen. Yeah. But the point is, the private sector is desperate, mostly, to get back. You look at any small shop, any small business, small cafes, anywhere. The 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 willing, the entrepreneurship that's going on right now. People are saying, right, I'm I'm no longer a restaurant. I'm now I'm now a takeaway. The, yeah, yeah. The, I'm going to do an online service. I'm going to do this. They they are fighting to stay alive. Public sector is going. Well, we'll just wait till yeah, it's yeah. safe, and we'll just hang but, out. But obviously, a feature of this. A feature of this is that the public sector is, in effect, getting larger and larger. I mean, I can't remember now what proportion yeah. of the labour force are on the government payroll but in some way or another. A, qu so a quarter are on furlough and a third. I know. I think more than half of the population is working age population yeah. is now because uh, about twenty percent work payroll. for the government anyway. Yeah. yeah, Douglas, let me let me uh, bring you back in here on on, on the, the on now the incentives getting so badly bent that it sort of. Uh, I'm not suggesting that everybody in Britain is enjoying this. Uh, they're clearly not. I'm hating it. And I can also see how bad it is for the company that I uh, work for, that I 
I run. But do you think there's a danger that we sort of told people, well, you can have 80% of your pay from the government um, and, you know, there's been very nice weather at the moment. Um, in fact, the only rule on furlough is that you mustn't do any work for your company at all. That would be a breach of the rules. So make sure you're putting your feet up outside. Haven't we completely screwed the incentives? Douglas, let me bring you back in. And then uh, we've got another couple of guests joining us uh, very shortly. Kate Andrews and Claire Fox will be joining us. And coming up later, we've got Karin Svanberg Soval, uh, my opposite number from Sweden, so she'll be able to talk about what's um, what's uh, happening over there and whether we've got some lessons to learn. But Douglas, on incentives, these have just gone. I, I think we have. Right. I think we've, we've stored up enormous problems for ourselves. All these furloughed workers. I, I think a big part of the problem. You said that you weren't enjoying this. I think a big part of the problem is that the group of people, the broadcast media. Julia accepted, the broadcast journalists at the BBC in particular, who ought to be asking questions about the efficacy of what the government is doing, are actually quite enjoying the drama of all of this. You know, let me give you a recent example. We know that fatalities are falling. We know that across Europe, the lockdown is being lifted and there's zero sign of a second wave. We, we know that the end of this crisis is in sight. And yet, far from leading the news headlines, the news headlines are all leading with stories about the childcare arrangements of a special advisor. It's almost as if the institutions and the organizations and the class of people that ought to be questioning the wisdom of paying people not to work are actually quite enjoying this. And I think they're going to be huge, huge problems. There's going to be a process of creative destruction in the economy. I hope one thing that is destroyed as a result of this crisis is the credibility and the reputation of broadcast journalism. We simply cannot trust the BBC any longer. Julia, you'll be the last woman standing. Stay with us, Julia and Douglas, but I want to introduce our uh, next uh, two guests. Uh, delighted to be joined by Kate Andrews, formerly the Associate Director here at the IEA, now the Economics Correspondent over at The Spectator, and by Claire Fox, uh, former Brexit Party MEP and the Director of the Academy of Ideas. Hello, Kate. Good evening. Um, Hi, Mark. Uh, great to see you. I hope we can get Claire on stream now. Um, Kate, I'm going to start with you, and I'd like others' opinions as well, because uh, Douglas said um, previously, good evening, Claire, great to have you with us, um, that, uh, you know, there are, and it's the, it, 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 it's an obvious point, I guess, but it's one that uh, I think can't be made too often. There are trade-offs here, that if you put in place a range of things that might minimise the number of people who get COVID-19 or even die from it, you're potentially knocking out 20 or 30% of the economy this year. You're doing huge damage to GDP. But I wonder whether it's actually uh, a little more sort of uh, complicated than that. If we, if Douglas is right, uh, Kate Andrews, and GDP falls 20 or 30%, having said nobody can make a prediction, I'm interested to hear your one in a minute. Um, this isn't just a question of like money against health, right? I mean, if people have got very, you know, falling incomes or millions of people are rendered unemployed, then this will actually have health impacts as well. People will get depressed. Suicide rates will go up. Malnutrition will go up. Um, you know, there, there's actually a health impact of being poor. So, Kate, my starting question for you is, Douglas says could be as bad as 20 to 30 uh, percent. Notice that he, he gives a a fairly wide band there, wise man, wise man, Douglas. But what's your thought, Kate, on the, the scale of the economic damage and how we get people to start thinking in terms of trade-offs? I don't know the extent to which the economy will contract in Q2. I'm not going to make a prediction, but if you do want a prediction, unfortunately, I would have to say that the recovery is not going to be anywhere near as bullish or as optimistic as the big heavy hitters have predicted so far. Scenarios that we've seen from the Bank of England, from, from the Office of Budget Responsibility, keep showing this V-shaped curve, which is that the economy turns down really quickly, but it comes back really quickly. Uh, the Treasury's leaked document suggested a U-shaped, which is that you're going to have a bit more pain at the bottom before things start ticking back up. And I think that's more accurate. To be honest, I, I think it could be drawn out for quite some time. All of these scenarios were based off of the idea that you would have lockdown, it would be severe, but then you'd flip the switch 
and we'd all come back and we'd resume normal life. And it is becoming increasingly clear by the day that the UK is moving at a snail's pace to come out of this lockdown. Now, a lot of that's being driven by public opinion. The messaging about staying home worked. Maybe it worked too well and people aren't ready to come back out. But you know, I, we, we are looking now with, with certain policies that the government's going to bring in around this two-week quarantine from the beginning of June if you want to come into the country. That's just decimating the tourism and hospitality industry in the UK. Uh, you know, we, we are still not able to see multiple households even outside, let alone be in house households, be in shops in a normal way. Capacity has been completely demolished across the board. Even if you are a shop that's able to open, it doesn't look like normal, it doesn't look like normal at all. So I guess my prediction is that this is gonna be a painful recovery. Not to mention that we have now have 8.4 million workers who are having 80% of their salary up to a certain cap being paid for by the government. Tragically, not all those jobs are going to be there when that furlough scheme is lifted. We are not waiting for a recession. We are in one, and it's very serious, but a lot of the British public doesn't realize that yet because of the measures that have been taken. And I guess the the, the political controversy that we've seen this re- week around the, the Prime Minister's chief advisor has really come down to this question of, of common sense. What is common sense, and were we allowed to use it at any given point in the lockdown? For me, what it's really doing is flagging how a lot of these policies now aren't very common sense. The quarantine one, as I mentioned, if you're going to stop people from coming into the country yep. in a meaningful way, do that in February, not in June. Um, it's very hard to argue that people can go back to work, that they can go to showrooms and meet their grandparents there, but they can't see them in the park together. Uh, I think they're just there's so many questions sure. now around the government's policy and whether or not it is common sense that yep. makes me think that it's going to be a painful recovery, to say the least. Okay, Julia, I know that you you need to depart uh, very soon. You've you've said you've bravely lost 1,000 Twitter followers by your stance on Dominic Cummings. So you've got a lot of tweeting to do to make (laughs) up that number uh, over the rest of this evening. But I'd just like to finish, Julia, by asking you before I bring Claire Fox in, um, how how do you think the broadcast media has come out of this? You you, you and your fellow professionals. With with just the Dominic Cummings affair. Yeah, no, with the coronavirus in general. Over the last um, couple of months, as the not, broadcast media have a good good or a bad few months? Give me a Oh, no, a definitely story. a terrible few months. The whole gotcha questioning um, all the time. I'm, one of the things I'm most proud of of my show is the amount of times people have said to me, I'm really listening because I learned something. I wish I think, have I learned something on the show? And I'm talking to an expert. Right, why you know, Why won't this work? Why is this a good thing? Is this a game changer? How does the test work? Why, why can't we all have antibody tests? What's the problem? Trying to actually glean information that my listeners could actually use in their daily lives to keep themselves safer and to know about you know why we're doing what we're doing and questioning the government you know is this a good policy what is the reason for this policy what is the reason against policy no the whole gotcha questioning which again motivated hugely by they hate Boris they hate Brexit a lot of them hate the Tories and I I think they're coming out of it with all due respect to the colleagues and I think a lot of them they're really clever people they're very talented people but because they move in a world that is entirely populated by people who 100% agree with them they don't come across anyone who thinks anything different um they they just don't realize what they're doing and and I think it's really really sad for a bunch of really clever very talented people just not to realize how biased they are so Julia give them a score out of 10 your fellow broadcast media professionals 10 being absolute perfection in imparting information I'm gonna go with I'm being a generous six Oh, six. Oh, okay, that's pretty good. So there you go. Well, there you go. The broadcast media, not to be trusted, falling down around your ears and eyes. Uh, other than, of course, if you, ch- you you must, that means, tune in to Julia Hartley Brewer's show on Talk Radio <laughs> uh, every day for the perfect, unalloyed truth. Julia, it's been fantastic to have you with us. Thank you very much indeed and have a great Thank you evening. for having me. Hey, Julia. And um, Claire, let me bring you in. Sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, the question I wanted to put to you was uh, really about... Um, compliance that we've got all of these very sort of strange rules that are uh, incredibly precise but also extremely difficult to interpret um what do you make of the guidance and advice that the british government has been has given and as a kind of radical revolutionary woman yourself aren't aren't you a bit flabbergasted that there aren't more people just ignoring it and or, or maybe there are and they just they're just not members of my uh, family or circle of friends but you know where's the revolution against all of this? Uh, Well, listen, it's been a great discussion and you've covered a lot of this implicitly, I think. Um, I, at the beginning, 
was happy, and I think a lot of people were, to say this is an unknown virus, a, a pandemic. We all got out our copies of Camus' The Plague. And, you know, he was a great freedom fighter and he uh, goes along with, you know, you have to do certain things to stop the transmission of a certain disease. And people didn't want to pass it on. And so as an act of, I think, altruism and social solidarity and civic responsibility, people took measures and, and bought, not bought into the lockdown, it's not cynical, you know, said, OK, we, we'll do this, you know. And the NHS argument, not so much in a kind of sacralization of the NHS, but, you know, the, the hospitals will be overwhelmed. And at that stage, the virus did look as though it needed ventilation. You know, you needed to have these ventilators, very intense type of healthcare. We'd seen what happened in Italy. So we go along with it, right? And I don't think that showed a, a kind of sheepish orthodoxy. It wasn't the same, by the way, as Owen Jones tweeting. You know, I never thought I'd say welcome to the police state and thank goodness for being, you know, house arrests brought in by a Tory government. They weren't enthusiastic lockdowners, but they were considerate. I think that, and actually, to be fair to Boris Johnson, at that point, he posed it very much as a kind of voluntary action. I mean, it had a kind of, you've got to do this, but it felt like I'm asking you to do it. It didn't take long for that to change, though. And the next minute, you see the overzealous policing by the police force, councils closing parks. You had a kind of uh, curtain-switching encouragement, almost. And what was so ironic, and this is why it's so ironic about what's happened to Dom Cummings, in a way. Actually, if you read, as uh, I heard Douglas saying, if you read the legislation and the fine print, if you look at the details of the guidance on the health on the on the websites and so on, it's reasonably nuanced. But that's not what they told us day after day in those daily health press conferences. So there is actually room for you to use your judgment and to have discretion. But they didn't trust us enough to tell us that. So what do, do you think, was, Claire? Do you think, Claire, we could have done all that we needed to do within the normal common law? But clearly, if you know you've got COVID nineteen and you deliberately spit in the face of a police officer, right? There are already rules against that, I think, right? I think I think so, but I, I I'm I'm trying to explain that I think there was different phases. I think I I am of this the opinion that possibly Sweden did the right thing. I was very reluctant on the lockdown. What what I'm trying to more described, though, is we went along with it, but they changed the rules of that quite quickly. So it went from being a we're all in it together to a suddenly stay at home or you'll kill people. If you sit on a park bench and get a bit of sunlight, you are breaking the rules. So they emphasise this kind of rules basis thing. And there was threats. I mean, I think that Judy said they're not prosecuting people. Well, they were doing a very good job of intimidating people. And so you'd get situations that, you know, it's always anecdotes a bit, but... You know, a mother of a friend who'd had a hip operation, who was in her early 70s, the doctors told her that she should walk, you know, quite far, right, to, or to, and, and her son who lived with her drove her somewhere, and she went walking off, and the police stopped her, and right. she, they didn't prosecute her, but the whole life, and she then refused to leave the house to go on the walk because she didn't want to be seen to be a rule breaker. So I think that we lost our confidence in, and I do think now there's a psychological thing, sorry, I'm sure. There's a psychological thing, which is I think that people have become uh, demoralized, fearful, anxious, don't, don't know what to do. And that's why there's yep. a backlash against Cummings because they kind of overinterpreted the rules as they were told to in those press conferences. Okay. So, but D Douglas, let me bring you in again before we let you leave. Are you, um, what do you sense of the mood of compliance, confusion, anger, or the, the early stirrings of a libertarian revolution by our fellow countrymen? I mean, I've been a bit, I mean, obviously, I'm not suggesting that people should go out and break the law, but I've been a bit worried about how utterly compliant everybody or the overwhelming bulk of the population seemed to be. I was hoping that we had a bit more of a kind of push the envelope culture, not ripping the envelope, but pushing it. And that seems to have been remarkable by its absence. Where do you put the sort of British people and the, the liberal spirit of freedom? 
I, I wouldn't rely on broadcasters to explain the mood of, of the British people. Um, I, I think actually Claire does a pretty good job of explaining where people were initially. This sense of civic responsibility when the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom appeared on our TV screens and urged a course of draconian action. I don't think a single reasonable person in the country, other than how do we how do we abide by this? But I, I have to say, I think there's a, a, a subversive streak in 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 the British, um, and I think many Brits will will recognise that actually there's something vaguely absurd about the police trying to tell people whether they can or can't sit on a park bench. Where they can only sit in a park if they're pretending to do yoga. Um, and I, I, I think this sort of um, the sense of the ridiculous uh, means that actually out there, tens of millions of people are quietly doing subversive things like sneaking around to their neighbours for a, a, a glass of wine, um, mingling and mixing. And a very good thing, too, because the reality is, is that officials are not very good at risk, which we ourselves are much better at making. And I, I actually think I'm an optimist. I think one of the things that this crisis will do is actually give a, a new lease of life to libertarianism. Never again will libertarians like me need to explain what the nanny state is all about. People will know it's ridiculous, it's absurd, and it needs to be mocked, ridiculed, and ignored. Uh, Douglas, thank you so much for joining us, my friend. Always great to hear from you, and fantastic that you always give us an optimistic note to finish on. So for all of this bleak period, uh, let's uh, we, we libertarians can at least point at how bad authoritarianism is. It's been a pleasure having you with us, Douglas. Have a terrific sure. evening. Hi. Um, Kate, let me bring you back in just as I get our next two uh, guests ready. You're, you're an American revolutionary. Um, uh, it seems to me that the kickback in your motherland, well, I guess England's your motherland, you know, your, 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 the fatherland, I don't know what you call the states, what you call England anymore in your own mind, but um, th there's been more uh, sort of civil disobedience there, right? I mean, there was this woman in Texas who, you know, went to prison because she was determined to keep her hairdressers open. Do you think the Brits, for all of our feisty, you know, two world wars and one world cup spirit, were actually pretty supine aren't we a friend of mine said it really well recently actually she said um she felt american but london was her state and i think that's probably where i'm at as well and it has been fascinating to see the difference in attitude between what's happened in america where you had people quite early on protesting very loudly outside of town halls to give them back their freedoms and the uk i think the most surprising thing isn't that you didn't have these mass protests which one could argue were a bit over the top in the states from time to time but that the uk has proven to be across europe the most timid and nervous about going back out. Don't compare it to the Americans, compare it to the Germans and to the Italians and the Spanish who have very proactively started to get back out there. I think that's been remarkable. A lot of this comes down to public policy. The furlough scheme, I think, has a lot to be praised for because it has kept a heck of a lot of people still getting their incomes when they can now be unemployed. But you have also given people a financial incentive to stay home. And how you undo that and roll that back is extremely difficult. So I don't think you can separate the public policy from people's attitudes. Um, people, re people respond to incentives. Who'd know it, right? Yeah, who yep. knew? I, I'm also going to, I will give the, the British people a bit more credit. I mean, when we saw the police start to overstep, especially when it came to such silly things like shops selling non-essential Easter eggs, there was public backlash. I mean, there meaningfully yeah, yeah. was. And um, while the police haven't managed to prosecute people, they have tried. And as far as I know, almost every case, if not every case so far, has fallen apart because the police have overstepped, but the British justice system and the British people have kept things in check. And, and so, I mean, well, the Americans, in my opinion, have taken a very, you know, freedom maximizing perspective and, and, and wanting to go back out there. We have seen some of the ugly side of American culture as well. Um, how many stories now about black men, for example, being shot by the police? Um, and in some cases, I think lockdown has had some kind of an impact on that story one way or the other. And whilst I have hated the overstep of the British police, I've also been reminded and quite grateful that in this country, there is a healthier dynamic between people and the police, and there is a mechanism to push back. So I'm not so worried about that in the long term. I'm much more worried about the short to medium term impact on what this is going to do to prosperity and, and standards of living. As you said, Mark, you know, for, for every percentage of unemployment, you see additional percentage of unemployment, you see chronic health conditions creep up. 
There's mm-hmm. studies that show that the loss of a job can be just as, as painful um, as, yeah. as a personal loss. So there, there's going to be so much pain in the near future. Um, I'm not too worried about the police state okay. at this point. I'm worried about the economy. Okay. Well, in terms of what we can learn from elsewhere, let's bring on our next two guests. Claire and Kate, please stay with us. Um, delighted to be joined by Adam Barter, who uh, works Hungarian, but works uh, with us at the IA in London. And my good friend, Karin svanberg Soval. I know I've mangled the pronunciation of that, but I'm going to have to ask Karin how to... I've known Karin for 10 years, and I still can't pronounce her surname so i'm gonna um, uh, how do i pronounce your surname karen you're on mute at the moment oh good we can we can hear you now did i get that right Svanberg soval no, no. Uh, <laughs> but, it's, uh, but it's okay <laughs> it's okay okay well l- l- last week i had to uh chair an ia webinar in which we had angus mcneil mp on um and his constituency i had to get him to write down phonetically how to pronounce it Nahail N-N-N ear is how you pronounce Angus McNeil's constituency. Sounds more like he's an MP from Middle Earth than from Scotland, I think. So sorry I mangled your uh, surname again, Karin, but thank you for joining us from the last free nation on earth in Sweden. Uh, perhaps you can say what's going on there. We're, 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 uh, we sort of free market types in the UK are now looking over to Stockholm uh, with envious eyes. Uh, we're usually looking over to you as being people who spend way too much money and are far too interventionist. But you, you seem to be the last flame of liberty, aren't you? Yeah, it's crazy. I think it's an interesting reminder that everything is relative. Um, I mean, I, I became a classical liberal because I was so fed up with the social democratic one party state that just never seemed to end. And now I find myself actually defending the policy of that social democratic government who are acting on policies stemming from our public health authority, which used to be pretty high up on my shit list of public authorities that I really, really disliked. Um, but they are really the engineers of, of this policy that we have, uh, which is not about compulsion, but actually about um, trying to, to trust people to do the right thing. Um, there's a huge debate. I mean, I know that in many other sort of in the international reports, they say that there is an overall consensus that people are very happy about this. The majority believe, like me, that this is a sensible way to do it. But quite a lot of people are very upset as well. And they are very stressed out about the fact that the death toll is higher in Sweden than you would find in in the rest of Scandinavia. But again, I just read this article that the death toll in April, which was the deadliest, um, I think, in Sweden as elsewhere, was still lower than what it was in 1993 and in 2000. And there were no lockdowns then. So, I mean, we we need some perspectives here. Yeah, no, that's so. I mean, that uh, I, I want to come to that point in a minute. That I mean, it's difficult to compare. Like with, like, you could actually compare. I mean, the the numbers in the UK are like an extremely bad case of seasonal flu. But you obviously have to add into that that we've mitigated the total number of deaths because of the lockdown, right? You don't sure. know how many the counterfactual is. But are you saying, Corin, that in Sweden, um, rather than this being? Uh, uh, part of your um, brave Viking DNA. This is just a matter of complete luck that you fluked upon a particular scientific advisor who hasn't taken such a totalitarian view as other scientific advisors in other European states. Yes. Okay, <laughs> as simple as that. Okay. <laughs> I think so, actually. I think, I mean, the government would basically have done whatever the state epidemiologist said, because that's the tradition that we have, that's the political culture that we have. Um, But I think we've been lucky that we've had an extremely uh, stress tolerant person who is, you know, seems mildly autistic, uh, which is very helpful at this point because he's very insensitive to to the criticism that he he receives. Um, And I think, I mean, the the most sane part about the strategy is really that he said that we don't know what the death toll will be in the end, but we will have to sort of, uh, since we don't know exactly what will happen, it's likely to think that it will be something that will go on for months and months and months. And if you think that we're in it for the long term, that this is not something that's going to end, you know, in two, three weeks time, you can't lock people up for a year. You just can't do that. So you have to have a strategy that, you know, that people can actually cope with for longer. Um, And I think that was unusually sensible, um, especially coming from that particular public agency. 
Okay, well, I'm glad you lucked out in Stockholm. We seem to have uh, stumbled across uh, slightly less enlightened scientific uh, advisors in the UK, at least from a classical liberal perspective. Adam, let me come to you. Uh, Adam Barter, the director of Epicenter. If you were to look across Europe as a whole, uh, give me the country or two who are getting it right and the country or two who are getting it wrong. I think Kate, Claire and our previous guests think that the UK might very well be in the getting it wrong category. I think that's difficult to say, but I would disagree with many of the previous speakers um, and say that neither the Swedish example nor the incredibly strict um, Italian or French example is the one to follow. In my experience, if I look around European countries, um, the ones that implemented a strict lockdown very early on actually managed to lift those lockdowns pretty soon um, after they were implemented. So if you look at Austria, if you look at Denmark, they had strict lockdowns for almost a month. But then gradually, they were able to phase those lockdowns out. They reopened school first. They kind of reopened the outside and restaurants and takeaways. And life is slowly returning back to normal. And I think if you look at history, if you look at the flu pandemic in the US in the 1918 and 19 season, um, it's a very similar experience. Cities that implemented lockdowns early on actually came out economically and from a public health perspective much better out of the whole situation than those who lag behind. But it's not, I mean, the Claire Fox, let me come back to you, Claire. Uh, it, my worry, and you alluded to this earlier, Claire, was uh, we've been discussing it, that the sort of initial justification, and I guess this goes to Adam's point of, you know, doing something very harsh early, was to stop the immediate pressure on healthcare facilities. Um, but that that's now been kind of airbrushed out of the campaign message. As um, I said earlier in the show, uh, Chris Snowden, my colleague at the IA, tweeted, it's week 10, is the NHS safe yet? It now seems to be that we're going to stay in lockdown, as Corinne was potentially saying, uh, if we follow the logic of our own government, until the virus has been defeated. Well, that's not moving the goalposts. That's playing a completely different sport, isn't it, Claire? Well, actually, I think that one of the explanations for this conversation about whether, you know, the British public are more compliant or more obedient is partly explained by the emphasis on the NHS. And goodness knows, people here will know that that sacralisation of the NHS and the way it got turned into a political football actually did have an impact. It became a kind of moral blackmail. I mean, how many times were we introduced to health workers and so on and told we were doing it for them? You know, every time I raised a critical voice, somebody would say, my daughter works as a nurse. How dare you? She's on the front line. She hasn't got PPE. And there was a number of problems with this, by the way, which is that, as we now know, as has become apparent, and I think Douglas referred to it earlier, that actually in the name of saving the NHS, and in this kind of general lockdown culture, we forgot about the care homes. In fact, we shipped all the elderly out of the hospitals and put them in the care homes. Great. Right. So we saved the NHS and it didn't matter. And, and because there was a, a lockdown fanaticism going on, a clamour from the media. If you remember, the media in those press conferences early on were saying, when are you bringing in a lockdown? When are you going to get the police to round people up? Why are the pubs open? So they wanted everyone. Why is anyone taking a tube anywhere? Because they didn't notice that most workers actually need to get to work. But, you know, they've never thought of that. But you've got all this going on. And I think that, therefore, the health service got turned into this thing that made people even more anxious about breaking the lockdown and, 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 and distracted us from the fact that the NHS wasn't being overwhelmed. I mean, we have to also remember, by the way, because the nature of the virus wasn't very well known, was it? I mean, it's pretty obvious internationally at the beginning that it was being treated incorrectly, not maliciously. And the most intensive form of healthcare that was being administered and people in ICUs and so on isn't probably what they needed to do. It was kind of one of those things that that's why all those Nightingale hospitals that were built full of ventilators and then it's like oh yeah. um possibly not and so you've got that going on i think um so in, in that sense i think that they distracted i actually genuinely believe 
that we have carried on the lockdown because the popular press pushed on and on about different things. And instead of the like PPE, like testing, like all of these things. So it felt to me as though the government, rather than actually having a strategy where they sat back and made political decisions, having listened to some scientific evidence, effectively were trying to keep the media happy by setting up targets. Oh, don't worry, we'll set this up, we'll build that hospital, we'll we'll get 100,000 yeah, tests yeah. a day. It didn't ever feel as though it was a sensible strategy. I disagree with Adam that, you know, short shot uh, lockdown, but I've heard that argument. But we didn't even yeah. have that debate in this country, and we yeah, should have yeah. had a debate about it. Yeah, I mean, I find that the, the whole, I mean, you, you could say with the, technically and logically within its own terms, protect the NHS worked. We just made sure people died in care homes, not in hospitals. So, I mean, if that was actually the trade-off you cared about. And uh, as many people of a classical liberal persuasion have put forward, this protect the NHS thing was news to me. I thought I got a colossal tax bill every month so the NHS could protect me, not the other way around. I didn't realise I had to write them a cheque and then protect them as well in my spare time and give up my job. But Kate, I want to come uh, to you uh, before we bring in uh, two additional des- uh, guests, because you've been a, a long-term commentator, uh, researcher and analyst on comparative healthcare systems, Kate, and have uh, bravely uh, sought to put on the table might there be something that the UK from learn from a different country? Just possibly, is it possible that Johnny Foreigner has got any element of this right rather than us in Britain? A complete fool's errand, I should say, <laughs> but nevertheless a noble enterprise. What What's your impression of how the National Health Service, A, has objectively stacked up to this uh, uh, crisis, uh, and B, comparatively, and is there any chance at the end of this we might look across the English Channel and say, you know what, some people over there might might have a system that's better than ours? I'd say a few things. First, I am sympathetic to the point that when this virus was first coming to our shores, we did not know what it was going to do. And the worst case scenarios would have had us looking worse than Italy. P- young people literally dying outside of hospitals and tents. I have sympathy for what the government was trying to do at the time. Um, on reflection, and perhaps actually much earlier on, we should have realized that sending elderly people to care homes without tests which the government has completely failed on, was a huge mistake. And as you say, Mark, if the NHS isn't there to protect you, then why is it there? Um, So I I think that you can be sympathetic to the strategy, but also they should have backtracked and changed course very, very quickly. Am I optimistic about the future? I think I've been naively optimistic on this point for years now because I keep making it and it's quite unpopular. But we have seen quite dramatic public opinion changes when it came to the migrant surcharge for the NHS. The idea that the British public would have been okay with giving foreigners coming here a free pass, as so to speak, in terms of a visa application fee just months ago is hard to fathom. And all of a sudden they were more open minded to it. So should we now recognize that Germany and Sweden and Denmark have different healthcare systems and do it differently, we should. And I I really hope we will. Um, If I could just conclude by saying one thing, I think the media has been a a big part of the discussion tonight. And while mistakes have obviously been made, I think there's another dynamic in which we need to bring in here and and, and lay some blame. Um, One of the reasons that we're moving so slowly out of lockdown isn't simply because the media has been sort of promoting public opinion in a way that the government might listen to. Don't forget, newspapers have a real incentive to get people back out there because people aren't buying papers right now. Um, We have a big problem. Oh, come on. People weren't buying newspapers anyway. They're buying far fewer now. But we have a big problem on our hands that the government has already decided uh, to start playing the blame game by pointing fingers, particularly at the moment at the scientists, for why the UK is going to be in this position with potentially the highest death toll in Europe and also potentially the worst economy. And I think because of that, I wouldn't be surprised if scientists were now trying to take the most cautious approach in their advice because they know that they will be one of the targets when the inquiry starts and and we all become blamed. So unfortunately, we've moved into a political phase quite quickly. And those politics, I think, are now getting in the way of a lot of strategic decision making. And unfortunately for the general public, I think that's resulting in a slower exit out of lockdown than we otherwise might have gotten. 
Jeez, just... Kate. Kate, Kate, about about a paragraph ago, you said you were very optimistic. You just totally depressed me. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm optimistic that one day we might acknowledge that Germany also has universal health care. And it's not just as the Sweden, oh, right. Norway, that, as Hong Kong. It's not just the NHS. That's I'm the pessimistic. height of your ambition, yeah? We might acknowledge that the Germans have universal health care uh, one day. I think I, I you know better than most that if we do get people to acknowledge that, that would be uh, you know, the win of a decade, possibly the win of a century. I am pessimistic, as I think many classical liberals are, that politics ever pans out in an efficient and helpful manner usually doesn't. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. Uh, what's your optimism score out of 10, Kate? You know, I do this barometer on Live with Littlewood each week. It's highly market sensitive information. So okay. bear that in mind before you give me a number out of 10. No, I'm quite pessimistic at the moment. I think it's going to be a long summer. So I'm going to say a four. Jeez, you, you've gone down since you were last on the show. Claire, go on, give us some optimism, Claire. Come on. You're an upbeat, um, optimistic person. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that uh, Kate's absolutely spot on about the science political uh, moment, but I do think that the politicians have been utterly cowardly, and this is what I'd like to have a go at Dominic Cummings over, not whether he drove to Durham for his kid, um, because I think that kind of, we're only following the science, was an act of great cowardice. I mean, they, they wouldn't own their decisions, and it's ironic, because I've just, you know, scuffed my own... <laughs> not so brilliant career by standing as for the Brexit party as an MEP and so on, so that we would be in a position where, uh, you know, politicians couldn't hide behind unelected technocrats. And there we have a How, How's that working out for you? Yeah. yeah, how's that working out for you? <laughs> exactly. And then, we, and then we're all reduced to kind of sitting on the sofa, listening to politicians say, oh, we're only doing what they told us to do. So you can't hold us to account. And now trying to blame them. And, I, you know, the scientists might have actually fallen for that, but it's, a, it's an unsavoury spectacle. Just on the optimism question, right, pessimism, quick. They have, you know, you have to um, live freedom. You have to, you know, it's not just about saying the word. You actually have to go out there every day. And I do think that they told us that you would stay at home, be hero, sorry, you'd be heroes and save lives if you did nothing. They pay you to do it, stay at home, do nothing. That is a demoralizing, demobilizing message for anyone, right? Because effectively, we're told we're not wanted. They didn't, in creative terms, think, well, there's an awful lot of young people. We could have got them mobilized to go out and, I don't know, paint the outside of old people's homes. You know, done all this. They had the NHS army, which, by the way, most of them were sitting at home waiting for the call. Yeah, People work. wanted to help. They wanted to actively help fight a national emergency and they were effectively told that what you should do do as an active citizen was nothing and i think that that was a terrible terrible message but hang on there was this there was this volunteer thing wasn't there no, but i said you people yeah. signed up three quarters and of a million no, uh, most right. of them didn't even get a call but no. also it wasn't yeah. why just nhs army why not have a whole range of different things they yeah meals on wheels all they of that sort of stuff they didn't even take the opportunity to mend the roads while there was no one on the roads. I mean, <laughs> in some ways, they've just, they just basically closed everything down. So I think that has taken the, the stuffing out of people, right? It is it, it genuinely, this is where the, my pessimism comes. Will people remember what it means to be a free citizen? Positive side, we are going to need the most enormous bout of dynamic energy to rebuild the economy. I mean, the most creative, not just not just like go back to work. I mean, that's the least of it. We need everyone to take on the task yeah. of kickstarting a new economy. And do I think the British public are up to it? Yes. Have they got a leadership prepared to say that? No. Should we become the leadership that says that? Yes. Therefore, I trust the public and, you know, forget the politicians. That's my... OK, OK, OK. Well, that was a good, that was a good peroration. But give me the number out of 10, Claire. Six. Oh, we're going up, we're going up, we're going up. The aim is to keep it above five. That's good. That's brilliant. Claire Fox, Kate Andrews, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thanks. Lovely to hear from you both as ever. Stay safe. More importantly, stay free. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, good to see you both. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're, we're going to be joined very shortly by Matt Kilcoyne from the ASI and Darren Brines from Reasoned, uh, previously from the IEA. Um, but uh, just as we bring them in, Corin, uh, I want to come back to you. You were sort of saying it was uh, a bit of fluke in Sweden, perhaps, uh, with regard to the scientific advisors that you got. But in this next stage of the, sh of the program, I want to talk a little bit about 
uh, international institutions. That when you, how should liberals see international institutions? And uh, I'm not, I'm going to try and not mention too many times the B word, okay? Uh, mainly because you'll probably throw a brick through my webcam if I do. Um, but uh, how do you, which international institutions, Karin, do you think have come out well out of this? I mean, do you think that the, you know, the WHO has been great, the EU's been terrific, NATO's been marvellous? Uh, well, uh, uh, you know, uh, and if none of them have come out well, what sort of structures do you want to see? No, I, I mean, I, I was actually planning on getting on a more optimistic message, message from what we heard last. Um, but I just and, and then and then you managed to find really the sore spot here <laughs> because I seriously cannot think of a single international institution that I think have come out well on this. Um, and me not being a Brexiteer, but actually someone who's still have you know an ounce of faith that this project can be rescued. Uh, I think have been in particular very, very disappointed um, with what we've seen, um, both in terms of how the sort of, you know, the internal, do the domestic market has just, the single market has just basically, you know, collapsed in the beginning of this pandemic. And now, I mean, with the news today of this, you know, the new program that is supposed to mark a new chapter in the history of, of Europe, where you know, we borrow money that our children are supposed to pay for until 2052. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's madness. Uh, to me, it's absolute madness. Um, and even I, as someone who's actually been quite federalist at one point, is really beginning to feel like I'm at breaking point now, that this is, this is very hard to stomach. This is really very, very hard to stomach. Um, but I think and, uh, getting the single back, the single market back on track again must be sort of. If they fail to do that, then I think it's 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 lost. It's just really okay. lost. Well, we're about to be joined by two uh, more British Brexiteers. But Adam, what's your thoughts before I bring them in on how the EU has uh, dealt with this crisis? Although it's worth saying, I think that it's a bit rich for Eurosceptics to say the EU hasn't done enough when our complaint over the last 20 years was the EU was trying to do too much, right? <laughs> right. It might well be that it's just not an EU competence, right? I think you touched up on a very important topic. Um, I agree with Karen completely that the EU has underperformed greatly. Um, I think the fact that borders were so quickly shut, the single market uh, wasn't continuing as it was supposed to, it's a great problem. Um, but the European Commission didn't really have the tools uh, to kind of override the national governments um, of its members, right? So it's a very tricky situation, and I'm rather optimistic about the mid and long term. Um, I'm, I'm all for global trade and even unilateral free trade, but I don't think that's very feasible from a political perspective at the moment. But as a result of the pandemic, I think there is a great likelihood of the great decoupling uh, with China or from China, right? And that means in practice that a lot of the shorter supply chains and global trade are going to become more important. So what does that mean for the single market and for the European Union? I think it means that trade within Europe is going to be more important. I think Central Eastern European countries will become more of a manufacturing powerhouse than they are today. If you look at Poland, if you look at the Czech Republic, Slovakia, or Hungary, they are already supplying many of the goods to Western Europe. Um, so there is an incentive to keep this whole show running. Um, so I'm rather optimistic that they can save the day and, and kind of improve on their internal mechanisms. Good, it's not going to be an easy task. Good, good, good. Because I'm going to come back to Karen and Adam for their optimism ratings a little bit later. And I promise to introduce you on those points with a very upbeat note to try and get the overall live with Litwood barometer the highest it's ever been. But we're going to be joined now by uh, two of my good friends, uh, Darren Grimes and Matt Kilcoyne. Uh, Matt Kilcoyne from the Adam Smith Institute, di Deputy Director there. Welcome back to the show, Matt. Darren Grimes is the director of the uh, new outfit Reasoned and was former digital manager at the IEA. Welcome to you both. Good evening, Darren. Good evening, Hiya. Matt. Um, good evening. 
so uh, oh, I should also say uh, but, um, on YouTube, I've got a few questions I'm going to put to you guys on the panel. Sorry, I haven't. Uh, I've been far, far too greedy in asking all the questions myself so far. Um, but if you want to ask a question, please put it there. And uh, while you're watching this on YouTube, please remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Then you'll uh, be kept up to date with all of our vidcasts in the future. But look, I've, I've set up this last section of the show to be an all-out scrap between with, with me as the absolutely unambiguous neutral referee. <laughs> because in, in, the, in the Union Jack corner, we've got Darren Grimes and Matt Kilcoin who are in favour of Brexit and will be pointing, no doubt, to the World Health Organization and uh, all sorts of other international institutions, the EU, and saying how completely useless they've been. And, and in the uh, blue and 12 stars corner, we've got Karin and Adam, who uh, might, might feel a bit, let, you know, don't think everything's going completely rosy, but think there should be some international institutions. So... Darren, I'm going to start with you. I was initially going to ask you whether you were going to immediately agree with Michel Barnier that we need a two-year extension on Brexit, but I think we can probably gloss over that question yeah. pretty quickly. I know your answer. But there's a really good question from Peter Gill on YouTube. What strategy for the next pandemic? Well, obviously, we don't know what the next problem to hit us is. We, nobody much predicted the banking crisis. Nobody mm -hmm. uh, that I can spot was saying four years ago, be very wary of the bat soup in that Wu-Tan market, right? We, we don't know what the next crisis is going to be, but what strategy for the next, next pandemic? And what I mean by that is what international institutions, Darren, and then I'll come to you, Matt, um, do you want to see to deal with these sorts of problems? Because it's, you know, it's one thing to get Britain out of the EU, and you know, even if you think that's a good thing to celebrate that, but what, what do you want to see in terms of international agencies, agreements, or institutions to deal with these sort of crises, Darren? Well, I think I'd take that in two parts. So last time I spoke to uh, you guys, I asked a question uh, during a panel that you had on globalisation. The IEA has been doing all of these fantastic panels. And um, the entire premise of the debate was around not throwing the bathwater, uh, well, uh, the baby out with the bathwater. And I reckon there is a little bit of bathwater that we could let out, though. And, and what I mean by that is I am going to say something that's probably going to make me slightly unpopular with some panellists. That has um, never, ever <laughs> held you back before, so shoot. And that is that I think President Trump has got it absolutely right on holding the World Health Organization to account, for example, pulling the funding of that organization, because it has become absolutely clear that Dr. Tedro is entirely kowtowing to China. And now I, I'm not some swivel-eyed loon who believes that we shouldn't have any international agency, well, debatable, <laughs> international agencies that don't police the world's health as far as alerting, what I mean by that is alerting nation states around the world that there are pandemics breaking out around the globe. That, now, the World Health Organization was clearly found wanton in that respect. Uh, because it was clearly kowtowing to China and ignoring the calls by Taiwan and others. So it needs to be entirely free from politics, because I think, as has already been mentioned on the IEA's channel many, many times, there will be another pandemic. This will not be the first pandemic. The coronavirus will not be the first pandemic. But there needs to be a body that is free from politics. And China has been asserting itself in the United Nations, trying to make more clout for itself in the world. And we, as the United Kingdom, have entirely, and I think as the European Union as well, actually, have completely taken our eyes off of the foreign policy ball. Instead, Mark, in this country, we're having debates about a sudden car journey to Durham. You know, <laughs> instead of talking about these really vital debates like what's happening in Hong Kong right now, that's the discussion I want to be having moving forward. So there needs to be some sort of body. I don't disagree with that, but it needs to be one that's free from politics. Okay, uh, I'm going to come back to some of the challenges on that, whether whether it's possible to be neutral. But Matt, do you agree with Darren? I mean, you know, you, you were in favour of Brexit yourself. Uh, looks to me like our um, you know, famed British institutions like the National Health Service are not necessarily uh, bearing up particularly well to 
international scrutiny? Are you basically like a kind of, you know, England football fan who thinks, you know, this time we're going to win and we get humiliated again? And what international structures are you enthusiastically in favour of that would bind the sovereignty of the United Kingdom? I mean, just like the World Cup last time, I thought, you know, we had a great team, a great manager for the first time. We had a couple of weeks advantage, early stages looking good. And then, yeah, we blew it, penalties. And unfortunately, you know, 35,000 dead people, actually. Um, and that is a tragedy, a complete and utter tragedy because of a complete and utter mismanagement by our own home state. We cannot blame that on anybody else anywhere else in the world. Um, we can blame the early response of China, uh, the lies and bureaucracy that, that engendered the sort of the subversion, the shutdown of information, the, the lack and the stopping of the spread in the first place. Um, we can definitely blame China for that. Um, the kind of organizations like the World Health Organization, um, I, I am going to sort of disagree with Darren in terms of actually you need politics. You need Western nations to be really involved in these organizations because actually what you want in those institutions is for the, for, for, for the countries that have that transit tradition of transparency and openness and effective government to be involved and want and to be pushing that internally in the, in the institution. What you don't want is politicians to be involved in that in in that institution. So what we saw in the WHO is yes, when it was set up, it was doctors running it, it was doctors being involved in the decision making um, and in the planning for pandemics. But as pandemic risk went away, the organization became more and more decadent. It became a, a talking shop, it became a conference on a constant circuit around the world in lavish hotels. And then it became a place where failed politicians like Dr. Tedros from Ethiopia, who you know, yeah. allegedly covers up three different pandemics in his own country, um, gets to be in charge of an organization because it's just at the end of his career at home. Um, right. And that's the problem, actually, with most of the world's like, large-scale multilateral institutions, yeah. is that they became hobby horses for ex-politicians of national institutions by politics. People care about the politics um, and actually want to be involved. And then they also, okay. at the lower level, become a place where um, you know the, the gap year students of the elite um, have their first job. And that's a disgraceful attitude to, to okay. institutions. Uh, Karin, before I meet you again at a shindig in a lavish hotel, albeit not one at the expense of the taxpayer, uh, I need to ask you, Karin, before I let you go, what your optimism rating is. I'm asking other people to apply it to the UK, but to say Western Europe over the next two or three years. And the other question I'd like to ask you is, which international institution should we classical liberals try and get our teeth into and reform uh, such that uh, we have a good institutional structure in future? Um, well, being, you know, Scandinavian, um, if I say five, that would be very optimistic. <laughs> you know, that would actually be enthusiastic even uh, for being me. And I think one of the reasons is that I, I actually disagree with Claire Fox. I think that we've had we really had our fair share now of disaster socialism. I don't think that people have liked it very much. Um, I think it's quite obvious that all the things that we have warned about are now coming in, into play, and they're not very enjoyable. I mean, it's actually not very enjoyable sitting at home doing absolutely nothing. Most people actually fare pretty poorly for, for doing that. Uh, not consuming, not trading, not traveling, not meeting. Um, I mean, all the sort of the social aspects of the market, I think, have become visible in a way that they weren't before. So I think there there is a great momentum now for for our kind of movement. To How actually the hell does this only get you to a five? This should be an eight. <laughs> Well, again, I mean, it's like, I don't even acknowledge the scale. You know? <laughs> as for as for the institutions, I mean, again, I would say, still not having given up. I would, I mean, I my first priority would be to have the EU going because, as much as I sort of theoretically like the argument that we should get politics out of the of the economy and, and politics out of these discussions, I, I don't think it can be made. I think the alternative is not getting politics out and then just doing free trade. I think the alternative is, you know, is politics will remain regardless and the alternative will be more protectionism. It will be more, you know, we will produce our own stuff and not be dependent on China. Um, I just think that's a more likely outcome. And that's why I think that we do need uh, these international institutions and why we do need international laws to just prevent politicians from doing silly things, even though that, as we all know, is basically impossible.
So, so do we would, need to do we need to save the WTO, for example? Yes, I think that that would be that would be my my top priority. Um, apart from what seems to be the almost impossible project of getting the EU to actually function uh, again properly. I think the, the day WTO will, the day would, will would come be. when you give up on that one. The day <laughs> will come when you give up on that one. Why, We've why, argued why over transfers? this for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but the WTO, I mean, that, that does strike me as an institution that classical liberals could... I wouldn't go so far as say rally to the banner of, but try to get to operate in a yep. in, in a more functional fashion. Yep. Definitely. I can't persuade you to dial up a number higher than a five, no? No. <laughs> Damn it. Okay, this is going to be a close run thing by the end of the evening. Karin, I know you've got to shoot. Adam, please stay with us. Lovely to see you. Thank uh, you. Stay safe and enjoy the restaurants, bars and everything else you're allowed to have in Sweden that, you know, we hope one day here might come back. Lovely more to see ever. you, Karin. <laughs> Um, Darren, I want to come back to you on this this uh, this really um, interesting point about can can you kind of take the politics out of it because mm. that 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 that's clearly what you know people want rationality uh, within the institutions that we live under and it's one of the I think it's one of the uh, bases for these continual calls. Let's follow the science. You know, let's not follow politics. Let's follow the science uh, as if that's any more settled than politics in a good number of areas but you know how do you want to get the politics out of these institutions and the same uh, question I put to Karin I mean which are the institutions that you want to save rather than to smash if you see what I mean yeah uh, well I mean as a as someone who believes overwhelmingly that free trade has been a, a net positive for if you look at all of the stats I, I needn't list them all because I've no I, I've no doubt that IEA listeners and listeners and viewers will be overwhelmingly aware of, of those benefits. But I think you're right about the World Trade Organization. The problem is that we had these sort of starry-eyed ideas of bringing China to the WTO, and, and th that would somehow mean that they become these economic liberals and start to adopt social liberalism as their economy and, and society develops a middle class, which it, which it obviously has now, but that's not the case. What we're seeing is actually China has used its position to actually try and assert itself and its dominance around the world. I think as far as taking politics out of it altogether, I mean, one of the things I hear all the time from, and I've been arguing this point for many years now, from people who are pro-EU is that Proponents of it always say they quote Jean Monnet at me, and they always say Europe, and by Europe they mean the European Union, not the continent, will be forged in its crisis. And I'm like, well, what's happened right now? Because we've seen PPE impounded in France that the NHS has bought. The single market suddenly didn't exist anymore, and the idea was that you take away the politics away from we plebs who make bad decisions and aren't pro-trade. But what we've seen is actually during this crisis, France said, well, actually, no, we are going to actually close. The single market doesn't matter anymore. And we were told time and time again, the single market is sacrosanct. That is, you know, you can't get away from that. That will happen. You will get your PPE. We didn't. And even as I am not pro-open borders, I am someone that believes in the nation state. And actually, I think Agile nation states will be important in responding to coronavirus. It might, might not be as much as the IEA would want it to be, of course, but I do think that that is very important. But I think all of these organizations have been found wanting. As far as taking politics out of it, I think that comes from the demos, that comes from the people. And overwhelmingly, people are pretty angry, as you can imagine. The economic damage that the UK is experiencing right now is tantamount to that of coming out of a war. People are angry with China and want to see some policy-based responses to that. I think the IEA's challenge right now is ensuring that that is in the most classically liberal way it possibly can be. Okay, Adam, you've been very patient. Let me come back to you. I think rather like Karin, you're, you're, you're somebody who thinks that the European Union itself can still be marshaled as a force for good from a classical liberal perspective. What's your prescription for international institutions, be that the EU institutions or, or, or other outfits like WTO or WHO, uh, what's the challenge for classical liberals post this to 
reform them, change them, scrap them or adapt them? I think the biggest challenge for classical liberals is to completely drop the notion of nation states. We have to admit that if, uh, we, li- if we dislike the big centralized European Union with 500 million people, then why do we love Westminster that's ruling 60 million people? There's absolutely no sense to it. So I would really decentralize Europe as much as possible. Let's think locally, let's think regionally, and let's you know, kind of forget about the Darren Grimes notion of nation states because it's, it's not leading anywhere. So I, I'm being overly radical here just to annoy Darren, to be fair. But, but I do believe that these That's a very, very worthy pursuit. Well done. That's a very worthy pursuit. But, but I do believe that we have to have an overarching structure of free trade, of free movement of people, free movement of goods and services, and the single market serves that well. But but the problem is that nation states are still incredibly powerful. And the fact that Darren highlighted uh, the kind of protectionist attitudes of national governments um, when the pandemic arrived, you know, France forbidding PPE to be exported, Germany did the same thing. The EU failed there, I, I acknowledge it. But it was actually the European Commission that stepped up and resolve the issue within two weeks. So now there is actually exchange of goods between EU member states, and that's rather a good thing. So I'm, I'm very critical about much of the European Union and how the political leaders have handled the pandemic, but I don't think that nation states and their political leaders fear any better. Matt, let me bring you back in. And you know, a, a theme um, uh, for people who are inspired by the potential classical liberal free market upside of Brexit was sort of think global, not European. Um, it, is that unwinding a bit now? We sort of, well, we shouldn't be as dependent on the Chinese and the Russians for all of this stuff. So, well, I guess we've got to be a bit more dependent on the French, the Italians and the Dutch then, haven't we? I mean, is, are we actually going to discover that we left the EU at exactly the wrong moment? No, I don't think so. Um, I think that what you, I think the problem with sort of multilateral institutions is that they're quite often built by utopians. Um, they're quite often built by sort of, especially ones that are like totally global. They want to include everybody in the world in, in a sort of kumbayari kind of a way. Um, they and, and and it's like sometimes actually what you should be doing is doing goal oriented building of institutions. What do you want to do? And then work out whether having X, Y, and Z country in it in the first place is actually an obstacle to getting what you want to do or not. And actually, for the European Union, which wanted to integrate its single market as well as having uh, public support for bailouts and so on, actually having the UK there was a really bad idea, um, fundamentally. And for the UK, it was a really bad idea because actually we wanted to do a bit more interaction with uh, America and with our other English-speaking allies around the world, and that wasn't facilitated by the agreement of the of an inward-looking European Union because Europe is looking inward. And actually, Adam, I, w- I would say I think you're probably right. I think Europe is probably going to look inward, and um, it's probably going to sort out lots of issues with its single market over the next few years. I think America is probably going to look quite inward over the next few years. It's going to carry on with a sort of Trumpian. Even the Democrats' like economic plans are going to be quite Trumpian. Um, and China is looking more inward. It wants to, it, its statements today and for the past few days, it wants to create a dependency on its own self, um, an internal market for itself. And Africa is looking at it as well. And actually, there's a place for for free speaking countries, free free trading countries to be to be a sort of sort of sort of new Hanseatic league um, of those English speaking common law countries, including Singapore. I would have concluded Hong Kong until America decided today that it's actually no longer autonomous and can be treated as a a separate part of the world and the financial system, but also Australia and New Zealand, UK and Canada, um, and maybe even the UAE as well. Um, As to having those places that facilitate the contracts and free flow of trade between these inward-looking regional powers. Um, And those are actually, that's a realistic option that's ready-made and not like imposed top-down by institutions, by other people, but by people already wanting to do trade between those places. And that's the model. I would say it's a non-utopian model it has to be facilitated through law at some point uh, between those countries, and therefore I want to have as many deals as possible with those removing barriers between those countries. But you, um, you'd want it to be bilateral, principally, rather than... Rather yeah, than and it would move at different paces. And that's actually, again, the Hanseatic model. Those city-states didn't all sign up to everything all at once. They did it between each other on a single on a basis because they knew that different places acted at different times. And um, in the UK, and I'll take issue with you, Adam, here on this, uh, the UK tends to think at a, U- at a UK level, and actually, Mark, you're a pro-evolutionist as well, so 
I'll take a few with you as well here. Actually, most Brits do tend to, even in Scotland and in Wales, tend to think at like the UK Westminster level. That's why we've been fascinated by the Westminster psychodrama of who drove up to Durham or didn't. Um, it's the most clicked news piece on every single news site because people people care about the Westminster level of politics. Um, and that's therefore it's the right place where politics should okay. reside in the UK for big issues. Uh, Darren, let me come back to you. And I'm, I'm, maybe I'm going to inject a little bit of utopianism in it. For I mean, I think our, our viewers will know your story when you um, set up Believe the youth wing of the Leave campaign. Mm. You believe then you were being brave by taking on an almighty political establishment. <laughs> Little did you know <laughs> that your real battle would be the incredible battle you fought in the years since to um, destroy the Electoral Commission regulatory court and to have your name completely cleared, for uh, which uh, many congratulations, as you know. Um, although I happen to agree with you on the issue of Brexit, I think it's an in incredible struggle and triumph you've gone through. But let's be a bit utopian. Why not? Uh, why don't we uh, apply to become the fifty-first state of the USA? Uh, we're pretty much, you know, simpatico with the Americans. Your opening statement was, you know, Donald Trump's got everything right. I was going to ask you which particular part of your body you had injected debt hole into in order to <laughs> inoculate yourself against COVID nineteen. <laughs> but look, if we want to wield some influence, if we joined the USA, we'd have twice as many electoral college votes as California. Uh, our senators would have real weight on Capitol Hill. Uh, America's a federal country, so we could set vast numbers of our own rules uh, here back at home. America doesn't even prescribe whether or not you can have capital punishment or not. That would be a matter entirely for the UK. Uh, so if, if Europe wasn't your cup of tea, how about America? Well, only if they accept the Queen, and I think they've made their minds up about that one. I'm pretty, that's a red line for me. Um, okay, but is that so, the only red line for you? Well, it, if I go back to my political journey, I mean, I, like you, Mark, was very much an orange book liberal. You know, I remember reading that and thinking this, lots of stuff in this really speaks to me. And that was about devolution as close to the individual as possible. And what they mean by that is giving people purchase in society, allowing people to actually have more sway over the decisions that impact their lives. And we are the, one of the most centralised economies in Europe. And that, I think, is what needs to be addressed at the minute. I don't think becoming the 53rd state of the United States is going to help solve that matter. Or of course, it might. But I think that's where we should be fo like focusing with, with laser precision at the minute, because that's how, if Boris Johnson is serious about levelling up, that is how you level up, by giving people more purchase in society. I don't think you do that by abolishing the nation state, of course, but I think that is where we have gone entirely wrong. We're focusing on and I sort of disagree with Matt about a relentless focus on Westminster. I do agree with Matt entirely on the Blairite response to devolution, which was to give Wales and Scotland a few more powers here and there, has been a massive mistake. I, because I, I don't think it's country, it's not individual constituent parts of the United Kingdom. It's actually individuals on the ground. How do you get power to them as close to them as possible? That's where we should focus. That, that's really interesting, Aaron. And I, uh, it might be that we have to carry us over into next week's programme because the, you, you would have seen in the news today that, that there might be uh, different local decisions about lockdown, right? Mm. But but all of the uh, all of the discretion seems to be in a more authoritarian direction, right? We're, we'll impose tougher measures in a particular area if we need to. There doesn't. None of it seems to be in a more liberal direction. That if an area isn't flaring up, then perhaps they can reopen their hotels for sake of argument. So, uh, no, I very much agree with you that that uh, a lot of it, a lot of devolution is straight down to the individual, not another layer of bureauc bureaucracy. Uh, gents, we've got to wrap up, but I want to hear from each of you your optimism rating. And Adam, I'm going to start with you. I know you have a European perspective, but I'm going to ask you to be a little Englander for a second and apply your optimism to the United Kingdom over the next two or three years from a classical liberal perspective. Uh, what can we, we know that the next few months are going to be really, really difficult, but rolling forward to say 2023, where are you on a scale of one to 10? And I'll add these numbers into the, to the Littlewood barometer before I release them to the stock exchange. 
I am worried that the plan that Matt outlined for the UK to become kind of this global trading nation is not going to be possible because of geopolitics. And if that's not possible, then then I think the UK leaving the EU at the moment is very bad timing. So with my hunger and pessimism, I'm going to say a four. A four. Matt, cheer me up. I came in with an eight last time I was on your show, and I'm going to stick with an eight. Wow. You haven't even, nothing's changed your mind for better or worse in the last three weeks. I mean, Operation Birch, hearing about Operation Birch and the renationalization plans may have dragged me down to a two at one point, but um, I think we can, I think we can, I think we can beat them out of that with the Birch branch, hopefully. Okay, well, that's pretty encouraging. And and and, and Darren, uh, you know, sometimes you're a doom monger, sometimes you inspire me to believe that Things can only get better, to coin a phrase. Uh, what, what, what's your number for the next two or three years in Britain? Well, listen, as someone who over the past four years has been absolutely uh, hounded by the establishment and managed to win, I think in this country, uh, small people who speak up can do great things. And I think we are a great nation and can sort ourselves out. But I'm not entirely, I am naturally quite an optimistic person, but I, I'm afraid to say, Mark, I am quite pessimistic. And, you know, I've got two brothers at home who are unemployed because of the COVID response. And God knows what levels of debt that they're going to have to help shift over their work and lives. And I, I just look at the way in which the broadcast media have relentlessly focused on the fact that Dominic Cummins drove to Durham, as I mentioned earlier, instead of the fact that many countries in Europe have lifted their lockdown restrictions and have not experienced a second sting of the COVID-19 tail. And we're not focusing on those things. So until, Mark, you at the IEA can convince the broadcast media to reshift their focus on these happened, things. That's already happened throughout this show, Darren. I don't know what oh, you're worried that's about. That's it. There we are. Then, <laughs> then it, it would be a 10 if that's the case. But, okay, no, but if I, it's not the case, what's your I think number? I'm at a five. I think so. Yeah. Okay, you've given me a very... So we almost agreed. Wow. We do, Adam, uh, yes, on that. We, we are agreed, uh, yes. Okay, uh, uh, I've worked out today's number. My own was a six. I'm feeling a bit more optimistic than last week. But I can now report this market sense of information that the Littlewood Optimism Barometer uh, this uh, week is... It was very, very difficult for me. You could see me reaching for my phone because I had to divide uh, the number by seven. The optimism rating this week is 5.4285743. 5.4 in roundabout terms. Up, up from last week. I was desperate to get it up from last week. So, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Adam, Darren and Matt, you, you sort of helped get the number up a little here, Adam, you less so, but at least you were honest about your pessimism. Uh, thanks to for all of the previous guests in our show, Julia Hartley Brewer, Douglas Carswell, Claire Fox, uh, Kate Andrews, Karin, Swedish surname. That's my mission for the week to work out how to pronounce uh, her, uh, her surname. Uh, it's been a great pleasure having you uh, all with us. Um, if you're watching us on YouTube, please remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. We will be back at six o'clock next week, where at this exact same time, six o'clock Wednesday next week, where we're going to get even more optimistic than 5.42. Gentlemen, thanks for your time. Have a great evening. Stay safe, stay free. Over and out.